OK, everyone. Thank you for your patience whilst we got things reset. We're moving on to our second panel discussion on day two of Procurement and Supply Chain Live London 2023, which is always quite a mouthful. And I got through that, so I'm quite proud of myself. So we are looking at the Digital Supply Chain Forum. If we could welcome our panel guests. We have uh, on my right, we have Katie uh, Tamblin, non-executive director at Alchemist, and we have Piyush Malvia, vice president at Moglix. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start with something relatively easy and we'll chat through things from there really. And that is how companies can look to reimagine and, and optimize their supply chains by adopting digital technology. For you, what are the real key points of, the, of adopting technology to find that, that reimagining? And uh, Katie, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. I, I kind of see it as two elements. So one is the technology itself. I mean, there's, there's so many exciting things happening and, and the evolution of technology is, is rapid, as we know. Um, I think you can reimagine your supply chain in a million different ways. Um, one of the things I know this audience will be very interested in is, is procurement in particular and, and sharing of information. I think in order to reimagine successfully, so w just take one example, we have to start working with our supply chains about you know, around sustainability. We need to start co collaborating, right? We need to optimize to ensure that our supply chains and our value chains become more sustainable. The key thing in doing that well, that I think is often where these projects go wrong, is in whether or not your organization is ready and whether or not your suppliers are ready. So I think the critical element of optimizing um, digitization of the supply chain is having that service enabled layer so that you can increase and improve and make sure that it's adopted. Because the worst thing to do is to kind of kick off one of these grand projects <laughs> and then have it fall over because it just doesn't get used or it's too yeah. complicated for all of the stakeholders, both within your organization and your suppliers. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I'll just add on to what Katie said. Uh, I would look at it in a three-pronged way because the eventual goal of uh, you know reimagining the supply chain is you know the one of the biggest goal is being adaptable to change, right? Or and obviously being cost-effective and being effective vis-a-vis -vis your competition, right? So I would look at reimagining from three prongs. One is reimagining for cost optimization. Second is reimagining, as Katie said, for sustainability optimization. Third is reimagining for risk optimization, right? So three things. And sometimes in a short term, these three optimization may be counterproductive, right? Uh, sustainability optimization may work out better uh, in, in the year four, but year one, it may impact your cost optimization metrics, right? And at the same time, risk optimization, uh, and you know both the things you have to just sometimes not consider cost alone when it comes to risk when we look at countries looking at you know x country plus one strategy for you know uh, de-risking their supply chains given the current geopolitical scenarios as well right so there are these three areas when you look at cost optimization it's fairly obvious there are you know processes around how do i be more process efficient how do i have better data how do i have better analytics how do i have smart contracts in place right when we look at risk optimization we can look at how do I use technology to better predict the future, better assess the risk of a supplier? Many a time, most of the organizations work with thousands of suppliers. How do I look at it? What's the financial risk associated with that supplier? What's the geopolitical risk associated with that supplier? And then on the third part, compliance side, we can look at you know how compliant is my overall digital infrastructure is? Am I breaching? any s sort of data governance rules in X country that I'm not even aware of, right? So those are the three uh, you know, areas wherein we can uh, you know, then go deeper and understand how to reimagine. Oh, Piyush, that's, that's led me very quickly to an area I wanted to get onto, and it was a theme that for anyone who was with us uh, yesterday or was watching online yesterday, is the question of balance, which is uh, a word that has come up continually uh, about how you balance these different priorities, as you said, those, those three, three prongs. And sometimes they, there's friction between them. They work against each other. What would your advice be on how to balance those uh, as to make them effective and also make people want to actually buy into them within the organization? Yeah. So uh, I think procurement has to play a very, very important key role there. And what happens again is many times procurement as a team itself is over indexing on cost, say 90, 95% indexing on, on cost. So we have to be very proactively aware of what's 
say the percentage of indexing I want to put on the cost, maybe it's 60, 65, 70%, and then what's the sustainability metrics I want to put if I am at a sustainability metrics X, how do I reach to X plus X dash uh, in so and so years, right? So we have to be very sure working with the stakeholders, driving these three compliance sustainability as well as cost metrics, uh, measuring them down to uh, you know KPIs, which are not only procurement KPIs, but the cross organizational KPIs, right? And then obviously change management and the basic digital transformation uh, is the key enabler or success or failure factor there. Katie, your thoughts on balance? Yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think you, you touched on a key point there. You know, when we look at leadership within procurement, I think the critical thing is to achieve that balance, you need to have really strong alignment across the stakeholders. And I think, you know, we've seen certainly over my career the growth in procurement as a, you know, as a job function and as a and and in the the relationships that procurement people have to manage. So I think um, it's all about achieving balance. Is all about being able to maintain those really complex relationships across your organization and then with suppliers, and having really strong alignment between the the balance that your organization that supports your organizational strategy. So to your point, you know, how do you where is your organization and how is procurement empowered to achieve the right balance between those trade offs and and to manage that complexity. Just to pick up on one thing you said there, which is kind of the silver bullet to a lot of this, and that is getting that relationship uh, structure right within the organization. It's, it's often easier said than done because there's competing interests. Mm -hmm. Different people have got different targets, different priorities. From your experience, how do you go about trying to form that relationship? Because it's the foundation for the entire transformation. Yeah, I think it's critical, um, personally speaking, to break out of the matrix and the reporting hierarchy in understanding stakeholders. So each you know, procurement team, each individual procurement person is going to have a set of relationships that are important that they need to maintain um, in order to, to optimize their, their role, right, and their role function. That is not gonna be the same set of relationships that must be maintained in the organizational hierarchy, even in matrix organizations. So I think one of the things that uh, you know procurement professionals can learn a lot from is that stakeholder mapping, is starting by, okay, what am I trying to achieve? Who are the stakeholders within my organization, outside of my organization, with whom I have to have those relationships in order to achieve it? And then where digitization comes in is in improving and increasing the flow of information across those stakeholders. But I think we spend too much time, going back to your point about, you know, are you, are you optimizing here, or optimizing there? We spend too much time running the relationships that support our own organizational hierarchy and not enough time on the relationships that support what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. a good way of looking at it. Um, the way I wanted to break things down now is the, uh, the term digital supply chain is, is vast. Let, let's try and break it down into the organizational opportunities it gives you because it lets you do things in a different way. But then there's also the digital analytics side, you know, the after side. Let, let's break it down. When you're trying to put into place digital organization, change the way you're doing things, using digital tools. What's the best way to implement those? Because you're often putting that into a live environment. Business still has to happen. What is the best way to try and implement those solutions whilst the day goes on, whilst business continues? So I'll put that out to both of you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think very broad, but at the same time, what's more important is really mapping the value delivery, the effectiveness of a particular digital tool, because what happens is many times we get driven again by just the cost and budget part of it. But if we can really demonstrate how being more data efficient helps me be more adaptive and agile in year two and then outpace and outrun my competition, then you are, from a procurement point of view, really talking the, speaking the language of the business and not really uh, just the cost and procurement, right? So it really helps you if you can r um, help everyone evangelize and understand the value of effectiveness of those tools, how this data helps you outrun, outpace the competition uh, in the longer term. I think that's one very good tool to use. And I think understanding that anytime you change processes and you are changing processes if you are putting in place a digital solution where there was previously a lesser or a different one, um, 
you have to appreciate that the change management is the harder part. So, you know, now I have jumped into the middle age window and I have children who have to explain technology to me, <laughs> which is embarrassing because I used to be a technologist, um, truly. Um, but I feel like now I'm starting to see the other side when my son has to show me how to work something um, of what I was pushing. You know, I've been on the, in the corporate world pushing technology, pushing technology, and now I'm on the other side of people pushing it onto me. I'm starting to recognize the change element required. And so I think, you know, it comes back to when you put that in place, you can't just throw it into a live business environment and expect people to change what they do, especially when you have the wild card that's out of your control, which is your suppliers, you know, the third parties that really don't have the same incentives to adopt these digital yeah. technologies that you do. Yeah. So I think having a people element associated with that, recognizing it is a change management project in addition to a digital project um, is the difference between adoption happening quickly and adoption happening very slowly. Yeah, you can't just do one uh, one meeting, one uh, one email and expect everyone to be on, on top of it because let's face it, we've all had that at some point in our career and it never works, does yeah, it? Yeah, and people you know, have fatigue around digital <laughs> solutions and they don't know which ones are important, which ones they have to do, which ones are a sales pitch. So you, you really have to hold <laughs> the hands of your uh, stakeholders, I think, when you're implementing those solutions. Yeah. Yeah, remembering that, uh, remembering rural people, very important. Um, moving on to the digital analytics side, because once you've implemented a, a digital solution, which is far and away above things you've had previously, suddenly you're going to have an absolute tsunami of data coming at you, which could be incredibly valuable, or it could be completely useless. How do you go about putting a good practice in place to get the best from the data that's coming back towards you? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, so uh, I've spent many years as an economist supporting procurement professionals, and I found the most difficult part, and I say this to the data scientists I work with too, you got to find the story in the data to make it actionable. And that is what I feel like so many digital tools fall short on, okay, so what does it mean? <laughs> what does all that data mean for me? I think it's it's really important when you are adopting a digital strategy that you have the right resources, again, some of them human, um, some of them AI powered, and AI is transforming a lot of this, but it'll be a blend. You need to understand what are the business outcomes you're trying to drive. So if you are putting information in the hands of procurement professionals, what are they supposed to do with it? Do they know what they're supposed to do with it? Do they understand the value? Are, most procurement professionals are not naturally going to have a data background and be really keen to just jump into all of that tsunami of data and find the story. So put it, making sure that either the solution itself or another set of resources can help um, people you know, learn how to apply that, I think yeah. is critical. Yeah, no, no, I think you're to the point, Katie. It's what I would just add to what Katie said is, it's important to be more insights driven than just data driven. Uh, although we can, you know, always claim. In fact, we as a service provider work with hundreds and thousands of uh, large corporates, and 90% of them have some sort of data quality problem in some shape and form. But still, we have more than enough data than we are. We know what to make use of, right? So, drawing the right insights and mapping it to the right business metrics and KPIs is of paramount importance than just you know overwhelming with the tool. Because every service provider you talk to uh, will always claim that he can solve all your problems, right? But it actually depends on you. There, service providers are just tools to enable a business problem. It depends on you know users uh, as procurement and the end business users on how do the users use those tools to be more effective, right? Um, another thing you mentioned a second ago, uh, Piyush, that I wanted to return to, and you've talked about um, the impacts after year one, year two, year three. It could be very tempting to think we've implemented this wonderful new digital setup. It's meant to solve everything. It's meant to improve everything, but not making sure you've managed the change knowing there's going to be different levels of success. This is going to be the initial impact. This will be the impact in year two. How important is it that that is actually um, communicated to the business so people know it isn't going to be an overnight success necessarily? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, once again, it's, it's as important uh, the communication is the paramount is of paramount importance here if not communicated effectively if not over communicated effectively rather you know the message may just not land in fact there's a saying uh, one of our customers who had a very successful digital transformation story we asked the cpo you know what was the key success uh, what was your key focus so he was like 
only when the ground level staff start getting annoyed by my repeated messages i start that my messages started to land right so only when people come out complaining how many of these workshops are going to happen i am satisfied that the mes message has just landed right so over communication is very very important in such scenarios and again mapping to the overall business objectives blending procurement as a underlying resource for other bus right and then wrapping up the communication around that i believe is uh, the most important factor here I would agree with that. And I think, again, coming back to just making sure that you don't lose sight of why you're pursuing a digital solution throughout the process. I mean, these projects sometimes can be huge because you're changing processes, you're implementing technology. A lot of times, the people who are the end users of the tools weren't in the room when you decided to implement the tool, so they don't know what they're supposed to benefit from. So I think measuring, you know, this is this is the business outcome we want in year one. This is the business outcome we want in year two. We may not hit all of them and you know, but but we're gonna keep going because we recognize there's a multi year impact. And then having the right key performance indicators associated with those outcomes that let you know are we achieving? Because that's going to be how you find out, hey, you know, the guys that actually log into this platform and use it, they didn't get that we were aiming to achieve, you know, X, Y, or Z. <laughs> So we've been looking internally. We've been looking at how we work with our, our teams, the internal teams. Let's look externally about working with um, partners, suppliers, because it could be a big change for them if we've worked in a particular way for a long time and then there's a, a significant change into what we do. What advice would you have in trying to make sure that relationship and that change is as successful as possible and there is real buy-in to what we're trying to do? Yeah, yeah. I, I think one, you know, so um, I work with Alchemist and, and we implement, you know, safe contractor, safe supplier. So we work with suppliers to help them, you know, train them and, um, and teach them how to adopt these digital tools. And the thing that we learn in doing that, and I've learned across many roles, is that this is really hard for suppliers. It's on top of their day job. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not something that they intuitively get what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to change. And that's true of, you know, whether we're talking about cybersecurity or whether we're talking about sustainability or whether we're just talking about general provision of, of services. Um, and so uh, my advice would be understand that they are your partners in this um, and put a service wrapper around what you're asking them to adopt. You know, yeah, let there be somebody there to hold their hands and take them through this process because otherwise you will just get very little adoption because suppliers sit there thinking, what's in it for me? You know, why, sh why do I have to do this on top of everything else? And, and you know, it's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, so again, uh, just building on that, I think communicating, over communicating, and also I'm a big believer of, you know, big rocks, small rocks, sand and water philosophy, right? So you need to know uh, which are the key st important stakeholders there, and that's where over communication. Many a times, going back and taking their inputs before implementation is also important, right? Whether they have the right set of APIs, what do they need? If you can enable them, have the right set of APIs to integrate to your system smooth, and then, you know, eventually they will have to put five less sales uh, development representatives to serve you, right? So their cost to serve you also goes down, right? So for the big suppliers, that's the level of strategy in terms of digital transformation we need to have in place. For the small suppliers, we need to have better processes so that they have better transparency and understanding where is the company going, what's going to happen in future, what's, you know, for them, it's like what's going to happen to my business is eventually, you know, what matters, right? Uh, I'll share a one very interesting anecdote. We asked a very large corporate conglomerate in India who was deploying a vendor portal and we asked them, what's your strategy to, you know, communicate this and drive the adoption? They said, payments will only be visible from that portal. <laughs> so if you don't accept orders there, you don't know where your when and where your payments are coming from, right? So those are just some tools to sort of force adoption for the long tail of suppliers, but for the key large suppliers working together, in fact, working during the implementation phase, taking their feedback while you're choosing the right tool is also important. Because I know when I've done uh, webinars on this particular subject before, a question you can pretty much put your mortgage on getting in from the, the audience is, I have a supplier who is just not playing ball. They do not want to... They, they, they're so used to doing things the way they've always done things. They don't have the infrastructure to do it. And frankly, they're just making my life a little bit of hell because they do not want to buy into the way we're trying to do things. What advice would either of you had about how to... Um, 
optimise that relationship, <laughs> he says in a very diplomatic way. I mean, I would go back to yeah. what you said. The, the best um, success I've seen is when payments are not you know, made or invoices are not raised until that process is followed. Um, I, and one of the biggest challenges I see a lot of uh, procurement teams face is when they're kind of half in a new initiative. Like we're kind of half in. We we want to encourage our suppliers to do this, but we're not. There's not going to be. You know, we're going to go all carrot and no stick. Um, that that is a great way to kind of soft launch a project, but that often, if it's not followed up by um, the teeth that come yeah. with, well, at some point we just can't work together in this way unless you're going to follow this. Um, that's that's where you you know you enable that behavior is uh, is when a procurement team is kind of half in. We want you to do it, but we're not going to enforce it if you don't. That that puts your team in a very difficult position. So when you are dealing with a supplier like that, it can be particularly tricky if that is a critical supplier that you cannot um, you know change move away from. Um, so the alternative to just putting the teeth in, which is, okay, well, you don't get paid unless you do it this way, is to have a wide, diverse range of suppliers. You know, you start to diversify your supply when you encounter difficult suppliers and take the time to put into place alternative options is another yeah. opportunity. Yeah, another key question that always comes up is, is working cross borders. You know, if you're bringing in a new digital solution, can it actually sometimes make things easier? Because your, your initial response might be, this is going to be another hurdle. This is going to make things more difficult. What, what's, what's our experience on that? It, does it often make things easier? Uh, you mean digital uh, Yes, tools? using a digital yeah. platform, working with yeah. uh, uh, cross-border. Cross yeah, yeah. Yes. No, no. So uh, we do a lot of cross-border procurement uh, when it comes to consumables, MRO. That's what we do as a company as well. What we have seen is many times there's a lot of information which is not complete in even you know in a particular small transaction right when a supplier says it's going to deliver in a lead time of 12 weeks what does that mean uh, does he really have to does his production start on you know t minus 12 week or does he take three weeks just for his production manufacturing to be planned and then you know dis three another three weeks for dispatch and then another five weeks for you know shipping it from shanghai to you know a port in new york right what does it mean so having the right tools really helps you run uh, go deeper into you know those sort of insights at a transaction level also it helps you with benchmark information right when's the how much how long does it take does it really take three days to unload a container or does it take two days or does it take five days to schedule an inspection before dispatching it off the port right so those sort of information and transparency having it on hand really helps you uh, in the cross-border uh, procurement I think the other thing, I mean, there's a huge trend in building supply chain transparency, right? Because, you know, the natural consequence of globalization is that our supply ca chains became very opaque. We wouldn't even know who, you know, most companies work really hard to identify their tier one suppliers, and the majority of companies don't know who their tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers are. Um, I think one area in which digitization is really exciting is around building that transparency, particularly in cross-border value chains. Um, and as we learn more about the issues that are resulting from that opacity in supply chains, from not knowing I had a tier 12 supplier that was irresponsible and now I'm in the headlines because of it, because I'm ultimately responsible as the end buyer. Um, I think there are fantastic digital tools coming out. Altana Atlas is a great example, but there are many that are building auto AI powered solutions that will show you your supply chain across all those borders, yeah. across all those tiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's it's just a, a very exciting time to be uh, in the in the field. And Casey, I think you've probably got a view on my script here somehow. I'm not sure how, because <laughs> where I wanted to go next was about the most exciting digital opportunities. And because there are so many technological solutions out there, so many ideas, mm -hmm. which ones out there at the moment are the ones that excite you the most, uh, aside from that, that you think will make a real tangible difference to how people do business? Well, I think, and starting there, it's the underlying technology um, that I have firsthand, you know, both painful and joyous experience with is, is this kind of this knowledge graph um, technology that a number of companies like Altana um, are adopting. And it's, uh, you know, it, it gives you the ability to document and manage and predict relationships in just a completely different way. I won't bore you with the details, but th that's, that's a fantastic technology. But I think the other things that are exciting are just it, not so much about the underlying technology itself. There are fantastic solutions out there, but the adoption, you know, the, um, the ability to flow information across all of these topics amongst players in the space. 
Yeah. Uh, I think for me, one of the very important use cases would be contracting because we see procurement teams wasting so much time in contracting and you know there's one small uh, clause change with one supplier and then it's stuck with legal team for say two months, five months, I don't know what the period is, right, depending on the complexity. Uh, so one is creating smart contracts, modularizing it, making sure those modules are fixed so that legal does not really have to go through the entire document. You only have an annex here wherein the terms have changed. Second is governance of that contract, right? How do you monitor, you know, what was, how do you enforce the contract on the reality, right? Uh, what, were, what were the uh, penalty clauses associated with a particular contract? How do I get that information in advance before he really breaches that, right? What's the LD clause? If before he really breaches the LD clause, can I send him notification saying, you know, boss, you're gonna miss this, and this is the penalty, this is the cost associated with, rather than wasting time later on, you know, once I, I impose the penalty and then there is a, a whole sort of issues to resolve with the supplier thing, right? So I think contracting, smart contracting and governance is one of the major use cases. I think if I can just add one more, I think there's, um, there's also great benefit in network-based solutions. Yeah. Um, so I think as we start to get more standardized ways of vetting our suppliers and pre-qualifying our suppliers, yeah. the, the uh, network-based digital tools that let suppliers kind of complete a profile and then serve multiple buyers with that information, yeah. those are, are critical. And I th as reporting on, on you know, kind of non-financial disclosures burdens grow, those solutions that make it really efficient for suppliers to just submit their information once and have that available yeah. to all buyers that want it are, are going to be critical in driving efficiency there. Okay, there's, there's plenty more questions I want to go into, but I, I will always try and give time for <laughs> questions from the audience. Do we have uh, any hands from the audience? Any particular questions at this point? Oh, we do, uh, I believe just at the front here, and then we'll go further up the aisle after that. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, from Intersystems, one of the sponsors here. I, I'm interested in this uh, supply chain where you were talking about tier one, tier 12, et cetera. How deep does this technology adoption need to go when you want somebody to become part of the supply chain? Do you have to insist that the smallest you know, supplier actually has some kind of a digital uh, footprint? Or can someone further up the supply chain actually make their digital tools available to the people right down the chain so they don't have to have that yeah. you know, overhead? So at the moment, w how does it work? If I'm a really small supplier, how do I do I have to have some digital footprint? Is my question. Yeah, that's a great question, and the answer is no. That's what's so exciting about yeah. this technology is that it's using uh, a number of public and private sources to identify, um, and and there there are multiple ways that companies are doing it. Some companies are using trade data, and some companies are using they're building networks where everybody just inputs all of their information about the suppliers they know, the suppliers they don't know so it's imperfect because it will be looking for relationships you know some of these technologies capture relationships anytime there's a news story yeah. so and so won a contract you know you've got global tender portals you've got um, kind of you know public tender portals just <laughs> sucking up all of that information and and then some of it's predictive so I think you have to accept there'll be a margin of error on that you know some small suppliers they might be out of date or they might be wrong or some might be missed but what it's what the what the these kind of AI powered tools are doing is they're saying saying, okay, from what we can tell of information in the public domain and some in the private domain, these are the suppliers in your chain. And some of it goes down to the detail of, you know, so-and-so shipped this many widgets to yeah. that player over there. Uh, it, they're, they're really exciting tools and happy to follow up after on just yeah. the range of companies that are doing it and how different companies are doing it. No, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. And in fact, 90%, we work with 10,000 plus suppliers now, 90% of them are less than say five to $10 million in turnover, right? So you can imagine the digital capabilities they would have. I think we don't need to really go further. Uh, we just need to be curious and look at analogies from the consumer tech ecosystem, right? 90, 95% of the suppliers which sell on Amazon are actually that size, right? Now, how does Amazon, you know, uh, enable them to be digital, right? And th that's what we sort of try to adopt at our end as well, going to an extent that even suppliers' invoices are raised by our portal. They just have to block and give us an invoice series so that there's no reconciliation issue going forward, right? We raise the purchase order, we raise the invoice for them, uh, there is pre-vetting of it, and if that invoice is raised in Moglik system, 
you know it's ready to go for payment right there's no manual involvement there second point is there are a lot of ecosystem players and startups which are working with smbs to enable them so they are essentially adding the value of not just the tech layer but also the solution provider layer in between right they are doing the heavy lifting of putting up 100 people to just catalog that entire drawings of those suppliers right putting up 100 people just to enable that supplier to help him say sell on an amazon or sell on on amazon business or sell on an moglex right so those sort of service providers are also there so we just need to be curious and aware of what is happening especially in the startup ecosystem because that's where a lot of innovation is happening that can really help you you know partner with some key players category wise which can really enable you effectively deal with the long tail of suppliers but when it comes to the large suppliers there's no other way you have to go very deep in relationship help them develop apis help them reduce waste as much as possible because that then that's directly affecting uh, your bottom line effectively what you're saying is that there's definitely a gap in the market yes Yes, and there are a lot of services which exist, uh, but you know we are just not aware of. We are not really proactively looking for them. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Next one was just at the thank you. Uh, hi, Chris Massey from BP. Um, I think the the amount of digital content at this event and the conversation speaks to the fact. I think we're in a, a, a digital revolution of sorts. Um, we've spoken about software and digital solutions and the skill set required to interpret and use all of those tools. What's your advice to the attendees on ensuring the people in our organization grow their skills to keep up with the pace of change? <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. I think that's the biggest challenge that we face is, you know, enabling our, our colleagues and our partners in our supply chains to consume the right amount of information and consume useful information rather than being just yeah. blinded and overwhelmed by the amount. It's it's similar to the data question, I think. You know, it's um, it's it's it'll come down to how well tailored the content is for what what you need in the moment. I always uh, an old boss of mine once said, you know, uh, people are opportunistic learners. It's very hard for people to consume information until it's solving a problem that they have to mind at the moment. And I think digitization of content gives us the ability, number one, to consume a lot more, which has its positives and negatives, but number two, to have it handy at the moment that we need it. So I think sometimes my advice would be find a way to index the information so that you can have it ready for those in the organization that need it when they need it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, and uh, I think just be curious, uh, right? So if data is the new oil, curiosity is the new EQ. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are you know, man responsible for say procuring drones for your refinery to inspect, right? Make sure that you know more about drones than my 16-year-old niece who's living <laughs> in Texas and, you know, doing that for his living, right? So uh, that's the, the key point there. Okay, thank you for that question. Any further questions from the room? Yep, we've got another one on the aisle there. Hi, thank you. I'm Stuart Snow from Breaking Silos. So I've worked in procurement for many years. And the friction often between procurement and the stakeholders and finance, we haven't spoken about finance today, is about the, the single year focus from finance usually on savings, right? So you want procurement to focus on this thing over three to five years because it never takes just one year. But procurement often look elsewhere because they're looking for the next P&L impact. The finance are going, right, we've re-baselined our finance. Now you're getting zero benefit and the, and the function are pushed to focus on other priorities. So how can you help procurement as well with that conversation? Because having worked with many really good procurement people, they want to focus on the, the full life cycle. Um, but often they're forced to look at the in-year savings and with the costs of everything going up at the moment, that's really, really sort of relevant. So how can you help them as well? Because everyone has to deliver against their targets um, and procurement have to as well. So that's often the, the grind or the friction, as I call it. You go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely a challenge. I think um, where digitization can help with that is in again, providing more information and more inputs so that um, procurement people can balance those competing priorities. 
in all my career, I've never seen an inflation uptick where it doesn't impact procurement people <laughs> directly who are then told you've got to get you know less. Um, you've got to get more for less money. But I think the key thing, so how you, you, how you would use these digital tools and data to, to address that is in finding innovative ways to achieve cost savings um, and looking for mutually beneficial wins. The reality is there's no silver bullet to how you balance long term with short term. It's, it's a regular issue. But I think if you, the more information you have to hand through these digital tools, the more you can quantify you know, the long term impact of those short term decisions. Um, and it's, it's about building that story that says, this is how I'm going to balance it. Yeah. It's unfortunate for procurement people who are in an organization that, don't, that, are, that doesn't empower them to look at that holistically. Um, I think in an ideal situation, you would have uh, the support of, of high stakeholders that sit above both finance and procurement to enable you to have that space to consider the long term. But where you don't, you have to look for creative ways to, to balance. As you were talking about in the, in the response to the first question, balance your cost with sustainability, mm -hmm. balance your risk with, uh, with cost, and, uh, and to appreciate that I may make cost savings in year one, but if I damage my relationship with a key supplier in doing so, and then I lose that supplier in year two, I'm, it's going to cost me more down the road. Yeah. yeah, no, so I have more of a peripheral view being a service provider uh, myself. What we, are, what we have really observed uh, successful CPOs doing is, you know, they try to really weave in procurement in the larger business metrics. They rarely talk about procurement as a KPI. They talk about the organization's KPIs and how procurement and how the vendor ecosystem, which is you know the, what the procurement is responsible for, enables them achieve it, right? So just getting them back to that story and talking more revenue, more bottom line and top, uh, as well as top line, than just procurement KPIs is very important. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions. That returned us to balance at the end. It was almost as if we planned this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Katie, uh, Piyush, thank you so much for your time. Round of applause for our panel, please. Thank you. Thank you.